So as you guys know, we've been talking about the church of, which means brotherly love, right? The church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter three. And uh, I love this church. Everyone loves this church because this church seems like they got everything down. Even though it doesn't look good from the rest of the world's point of view, it looks great from God's point of view. So we also had talked from each of the churches, we went through those parables in Matthew chapter 13. And we went from one to the next to the next. And each one, you know, is very interesting because you can take it in different ways, sometimes positive, but sometimes they're actually negative. But some that look to be like the exact same parable right beside each other, in my view of what the scripture is saying, say, say very different things. I think a treasure hidden in the field and selling all you have to buy the field is very different than a pearl of great price. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the next parable in our list in Matthew 13 is actually in verse 44. And it talks about a parable of a, uh, I'm sorry, I think I got the wrong one. The pearl of great price. Let me find it here real quick. 45. Yes, I actually was in the wrong section. My bad. Verse 45 of chapter 13, the pearl of great price. Um, now, let me see here. Sorry, I just lost my space. I can find the page down button. There we go. Okay, so. I'll get there eventually. I got my notes in Thessalonians up instead of my parable. All right. All right, here we go. So the pearl of great price. So in chapter 13, verse 40. 5 to 46, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So we remember we've talked through all the parables, right? We had the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the woman with the leaven, right? and the parable of the treasure hidden in the field. And each one had a very different view. So now we get this pearl of great price, and it, at first glance, seems pretty straightforward. It seems a whole lot like the treasure in the field. And honestly, you would say, why are you giving these two parables that are essentially the same thing? There's very few differences. So let's look at the basics of the parable. There's a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, and he finds a specific pearl specifically that it's a pearl of great price. It's extremely valuable. And he doesn't just sell his wares. He sells all that he has in order to get it. And he says, this represents the kingdom of heaven. So there's two ways that a lot of people look at this parable. Some read it and they understand that humans in general, mankind in general, they're seeking some greater purpose, some greater truth, the meaning of life, the purpose of life. And if they can find a purpose to their life, they abandon everything else to seek it out. And that has some merit because people are looking for God. They want to find God, right? And um, of course, usually whenever they find what they consider to be God, it's actually a corrupted man-made version of God. It's actually not God at all. And that's why we find a world full of heathenistic people, even in a Christian nation. Even among churches, they'll make a God that's after their own image. They don't realize that we are made in the image of God. But history, you know, also shows that many people indeed do find the word of God, do find Jesus Christ, and they abandon everything. Look at Paul, for example. He abandoned all that he had to seek Christ. Look at the apostles. They abandoned all they had to follow Christ. So that it does have some merit to look at it as us seeking God. And Jesus being that pearl that we're going to give everything up for. But others read it and they see Jesus as the one seeking the pearl. Okay. And when he finds that pearl of great price, he gives up everything else so that he can make it his own. And the pearl, of course, in this sense, is the church. The pearl is his bride. And of course, the believer in Christ individually also can consider themselves the pearl. And of course, who else has truly given everything up to seek us and to save us? And it's a beautiful interpretation in that manner as well. 
both of these make sense, right? Only Jesus has given up everything for us. And that would explain his great sacrifice. So let's look at it a little more closely, though. So let's first compare it to the previous parable. So back in verse 44 in Matthew 13, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth the field. So here we have a man that happens upon a treasure hid in the dirt, and then he goes and buys the dirt that contains the treasure, right? He buys the plot of land. And the treasure remains hidden in the field. He hid it back in the field. So this parable that we're talking about now, this man's actually out seeking pearls. It's not a random find amongst a bunch of dirt. He's actually out seeking something valuable. And he comes across this pearl and he sells all that he has because he has to have it. The treasure from the previous parable, it's not really described. We don't know what it's worth. The pearl, we know what it's worth. It's of great price. You know, pearls will always be valuable, particularly natural pearls, will always be valuable because they're very, very rare. I mean, you have to catch some 400 clams or oysters or whatever kind of shellfish you're looking for, and you may get one pearl, and usually it's not even that good. To get one pearl of great price, it can take a lifetime and longer. Some people will never find it. So the parable regarding the treasure in the field, we had a lot of dirt as part of the package. The parable regarding the pearl of great price, it was 100% valuable, every ounce of it. There was no extra stuff that came with it. It was extremely valuable. So if you had to be either the treasure in the field or the pearl, if you're going to be in the parable, which would you rather be? Well, I know what I'd rather be. I'd rather be the pearl of great price, right? So there are some distinctions, but let's look specifically at this parable. Let's read it again. 1345. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man um, seeking goodly pearls in verse 46, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the first thing we see is the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man. The thing about merchant men is they travel from place to place. They don't just, you know, it's not in their own city. They're actually going from place to place to look for what they can find and sell and buy, right? That's what they do. You know, there was another merchant man, somebody who came from a faraway land to seek something, right? In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's seeking something. He's looking for something. Jesus came looking for us, looking for the church. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11, he says, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, imagine God is speaking, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. That should send chills down your spine to know that the God of the universe, what's that? That's Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11. That I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. That's God himself talking about me and you and anyone who will accept his offer of salvation. So in, any, in order for any merchant person to own something completely, you can't pay for half the product, right? I can't say, here, here's 10% of the money and I'll take it. No, I can't put it on layaway, Right. Kmart, I remember used to have a lot of layaway. Walmart may still do it. I don't know. But you have to, in order to purchase it, you have to have something that says paid in full or to telestai, as you may have heard it before, right? Complete the payment. It has to be paid in full or the transaction is incomplete. Someone else can come and take it, right? It is finished. Now, that's the exact words, of course, that we know Jesus used when he completed his payment for us on the cross. He fully purchased us and therefore we belong to him. In John 1930, he says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. To tell us died, paid in full. That merchant man came seeking something and he sold all that he had to purchase it. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 20 reads, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, 
which are God's. You understand? He came seeking that pearl. He paid for it. You are now his. He didn't pay for half of you. He paid for it all. So God himself came seeking goodly pearls, and he found the pearl of great price. So now let's pause for a minute and consider pearls. Where do pearls come from? Well, guess what? They start out as something bad. All pearls start out bad. They're either irritants or an infection or some kind of problem on the shells, like fall into the shells of mollusks, such as a mussel or an oyster or a clam. And this little bacteria, this bit of food, whatever it may be, gets stuck in there. And these mollusks, they start to secrete a little, a couple different substances, right? I won't say body and blood, but let's just say they use aragonite, called it's a mineral, okay? And conchiolin, which is a protein, or the solid and the liquid get joined, right? And they join together to make the word knocker, which is the mother of pearl, okay? And that's deposited around the irritant, whatever it may be, and it grows over the irritant, turning it, this rough-shaped irritant, into a very smooth surface, beautiful circular structure. And interestingly, are they all white? No. Are they all black? No. Are they all yellow? No. They come in every color, every shape. They might be oblong. They might be circular. And there's something there that we should just recognize, right? So they come in all this bright. And how long does this take? Does it, I mean, immediately the process begins. From the moment they enter inside of the oyster or the mollusk, the change begins to happen. Sometimes it takes a while to rough up those, to take out those uh, rough surfaces and make them smooth, right? But it happens over years. Process takes years and years. So most of the pearls you see today, they aren't these natural pearls. They're fakes. They're artificial pearls that people grow in a farm. They take a bunch of oysters, they put them in the farm, they introduce exactly what material they want. And within three years, boom, look at that. It's a pearl, it's a pearl, it's a pearl. But when you go buy those pearls, they're worth nothing. They're cheap as can be. You can buy a whole string of pearls for less than one pearl that's naturally found. I don't know if you're aware or familiar with all that. So most pearls are not, they're harvested from farms. So what's also interesting about the pearl, did you have something? What difference is one's produced by man, one's produced by God. That's exactly right. One's produced by man, one's produced by God. But you know what's really, I mean, again, a true pearl, a real pearl, a natural producing pearl. It's extremely rare. And you got to catch hundreds of oysters to find one. And if you actually think about it, the pearl has no value, right? Inside the oyster. Once it's been changed, you know, you got to do something with it, right? It has to be removed, right? So they're removed from their place to become truly valuable. And when they are removed, you know what good oysters are? Or sorry, what good pearls are? You can't eat them. Can't flavor anything with them. They're only good to be used as jewelry. They're only be used to glorify the owner. That's all they're good for, right? Um, they have no other purpose. There's nothing else you do with them. They just glorify the person who's going to wear them. I hope you guys see all where I'm going with this, right? It's amazing. Isn't it incredible? Yeah. So again, the other thing about all this is this had to be somewhat weird for the Jews to hear. Jesus had talked about pearls before. Don't cast your pearls before swine, right? He had talked to them. And even in the Old Testament, you know, pearls were known to be valuable because they were rare. Um, but their value to the Jewish people has mainly been in merchant use, not necessarily to adorn themselves. Because in regard to spiritual things, the pearls come from unclean creatures, right? And their value should fade in comparison. In the Old Testament, when you read about pearls, it's always about, hey, this is worth more than pearls. This is worth better than pearls. Like, for example, in uh, for well, the part where we have that we know it's unclean was from Deuteronomy 14.10, when he's telling them about the animals in the ocean, he says, whatsoever has not fins and scales, you may not eat. It is unclean to you. So again, these shellfish were unclean. 
And then in Job chapter 28, verse 12, he says, where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? And he continues in verse, uh, sorry, 28, 12, and then down to 28, 18. He says, no mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. So pearls are kind of like, yeah, yeah, they're great, but they're nothing compared to wisdom, right? So to the Jewish mind, it's like, what are you talking about? This is an unclean thing. Sounds very Gentilish. Get it away from me, right? It's a strange thing to hear. But you know, of all the gemstones mentioned in the Bible, and there are quite a few, aside from coral, right? We don't really consider that a gemstone. Only the pearl, it's the only one that's produced organically inside another living being. You realize that? It's the only gemstone that we use in that way. Everything else is mined out of rock, found different places. And the only way to obtain the pearl is for the irritant to be inside the pearl. And the pearl uses its own body to transform that irritant into the pearl. And for the pearl to be born into the world, you need to pierce the side of the oyster and take it out. Just interesting. And again, you see the reference is all to Jesus Christ, of course, birthing us into the world through the Holy Spirit. He said, pearl will irritate it while the oyster was irritated. The oyster was irritated and it made the pearl out of the irritation. Correct. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of interesting imagery here, right? And frankly, if you wanted to make an entire sermon on pearls and how they're made, I don't think it'd be very hard, right? But the fact is, we're all sinners. And we've had nothing ever. We've never had anything to offer Jesus except our rebellion and our sin. That's it. But that doesn't stop us from being accepted into him and being transformed into something beautiful. And again, not all believers look the same, just like not all pearls look the same, right? Some are black, some are white, some are yellow, some are pink, some are tall, some are short, some are a little rounder than others, right? We all have different features to us. What's that? <laughs> okay, you don't have to talk about me. I'm right here, but okay. Um, but the thing is, the way that you make the pearl, it requires pressure and time, just as the church is constantly on, and individual Christians are constantly under pressure, right? And under duress in this world. But our new birth only is possible by Jesus' death and sacrifice for us on the cross. But ultimately, what's our purpose is to glorify the one who purchased us. The pearl of great price is to be worn. Another very important question. Yes, sir. Have you ever heard of a man being called pearl? Have I ever heard of a man being called pearl? No, I have not. The bride, that's exactly right. So the purpose of the church... And the purpose of the bride of Christ is to glorify the one who purchased them, that pearl of great price. It is a non-specific, I'm not saying there aren't Jews in the church, there are, but it's not specifically a Jewish treasure. It came from this unclean creature. It was in many ways non-Jewish. So we are from Israel. Of course, we are, Israel exists, Israel is there, but the church is from not just Israel, but from every tribe, nation, tongue. Right. So all true, true born again believers are unfortunately not as plenteous in this world. There are a lot of people who claim to be Christians or we might say artificial or farm raised Christians. Right. Well, my daddy went to church, so I went to church. Well, what is it? How do you get to heaven? I guess I'm a good person. Not the answer. Only one path. The blood of Christ. Right. There's a lot of people who think they're saved, but they don't know anything about why they need Jesus, right? So artificial Christianity is a dime a dozen. And we live in a nation of people who claim to accept Jesus, but they don't know why he died on the cross. They know he died, but they don't understand why he died and why he died for them. So that being the case, we should expect biblically, when we see the imagery of pearls, we're going to see pearls in heaven, right? And we're also going to see pearls that are left behind right? The true pearls and the artificial pearls. So you think about the great harlot, right? The, the great whore, the great prostitute, all the different terms used in your different translations. What's she covered in? Well, I believe many of those who think 
they're righteous and religious, but have never accepted Christ, that are left behind, join a new religious system that we're going to talk a whole lot more about, particularly when we get to Revelation 17. But it says in Revelation 17, verse 4, it says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. She's surrounded with pearls, right? All of these Christians, these Bible-believing people that don't actually believe the Bible. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And then Revelation 17, 5, it says who her name is. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So you can imagine the type of pearls that are going to be filling this woman in this false religious system are those who just claim Christianity. Again, they're a dime a dozen. Everyone out there, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But they can't tell you a thing about Jesus Christ. The only thing that separates me from them is nothing good about me. I'm probably worse than most of them. But the only thing that separates us is that I have accepted the blood of Christ for my sins. And I pray that everyone here has too. When those who have turned to him, we're going to find pearls in heaven. Matter of fact, the gates to the city are made of pearl. Mm -hmm. Revelation 21, 21 says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. So the true pearls of great price are found in heaven, right? And are of infinite value to God. He used them as the way in to his new Jerusalem, to his new city. And the pearls, of course, they were removed, were meant to do what? To glorify Jesus Christ, just like we read in the book of Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because of our testimony among you was believed in that day. We're here to glorify Jesus, both now on earth and then in heaven. That's what we're here. We were created to have a relationship with him because he loves us. And because we realize what he did, we love him. We love him because he first loved us. So the parable finishes with Jesus selling all that he had in order to purchase that pearl of great price. And he tells you that the, ch the church, right, that we are of infinite value to him. So when you feel like I don't really matter to anyone. When you feel like, you know, nobody really cares about me. I'm all alone. Nobody's interested. Nobody worries about what I worry for. Jesus says, no, I became a man. I went through what you went through. I gave up everything for you because you are of infinite value to me. And if you were the only one who would accept him as Savior, I have no doubt in my mind he still would have went to the cross because that's how much he loves you. And with that, we'll take a break. Any questions or comments on the pearl of great price? All right, we'll take a five-minute break.